there's a total solar eclipse of the sun coming up in April 2024, where the moon will pass between the Earth and the sun and completely block out the sun's light for a few minutes. It is the last eclipse that's visible in the lower 48 states until 2045. So if you don't want to wait another 21 years to experience this, then here's all the information that you need on the eclipse from when it is, where you can see it, what a solar eclipse is, how to watch it, and why you should care. So let's start with when the eclipse is. It's happening during the day on Monday the 8th of April 2024, and what time it will happen depends on where you are. So this eclipse will be visible across the whole of North America, but it's only along this red line here that the moon will totally block the sun for about two to four minutes, what we refer to as the region of totality, where for a while it looks like a 360 degree sunset, birds and animals start to act strangely, and an eerie light falls that few people will ever experience in their lifetime. Now, if you're looking top down, the moon orbits the sun in an anti-clockwise direction, which means that on this map, the eclipse will move from west to east. So on the west coast of Mexico, the eclipse will happen late morning. In Texas, in the early afternoon, in New England, in the mid-afternoon, and then in Newfoundland by late afternoon. I'll pop a link to this map in the video description below so you can put in your location and see what time the eclipse will start and end for your location. I also really like this map from the Eclipse Company that not only shows you the percentage chance of cloud cover along the line of totality, but also shows eclipse events and viewing parties that have been organized by communities in those areas so that you can plan where you'll be on the day. Now you'll also notice these other lines on this map with these percentage labels or on the other map that I just showed, those shaded yellow regions. This is where the moon won't fully block the sun out. So these areas will see what's known as a partial eclipse, which is where it looks like the moon is just kind of taking like a little bite out of the sun, which brings me to what an eclipse actually is. Well, while the moon orbits the earth, the earth also orbits the sun, which is what gives us the moon's phases. Because as the moon orbits the Earth every 28 days, we then see it from different angles compared to where the light is coming from. But that's the top down view. If we then instead look from the side, we can see that the moon's orbit is tilted by about five degrees compared to the Earth's orbit around the sun, which is why we don't get an eclipse every 28 days or every time the moon makes a full orbit because the alignment just isn't quite right for the moon to block the sun's light. So because of that, we usually get about two to five eclipses every single year, but not all of them will be total solar eclipses. Because another thing about the moon's orbit is that it's not a perfect circle, it's oval shaped. Meaning that sometimes it's further away from us and sometimes it's closer to us. This is what gives us the occasional super moon where the full moon is slightly bigger than normal. But if the full moon is further away from us at the time it's passing in front of the sun, then it won't fully block the sun's light. Instead, you'll still get a ring of light around the sun and this is what's known as an annular eclipse. There's actually one of those later this year in October 2024 that crosses South America. So it's a complete coincidence that we even get total solar eclipses in the first place. It's just that the moon happens to be about 400 times smaller than the sun, but also about 400 times closer to us as well, which then gives us that perfect perspective and alignment for it to completely block the sun. It's relatively rare when it happens. It's only every 18 months or so, or every 18 orbits of the moon. And even when that happens, it all depends on the angle again, where in the world gets that perfect perspective where the light of the sun is fully blocked and which side of the planet actually happens to be facing the sun at that particular moment to actually be able to see the eclipse. Which brings me to how you can actually view a solar eclipse. I will start by saying, do not look directly at the sun. You will damage your eyes. Even in sunglasses, they don't filter out enough light. You will not protect your eyes that way. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. If you are in the path of totality, then during totality, when the moon has fully blocked out the sun, it does get dark enough that you can actually just look at it with your eyes. But do be very, very careful because it gets dangerously bright in an instant as soon as the moon moves enough along its orbit that the sun is revealed once more. Now to watch the progress of the eclipse and see the moon inching further and further along the face of the sun, then there's a couple of different options that you can use. Option one is wearing 
wearing eclipse glasses. This is the most immersive way to watch in my opinion. These are not sunglasses. They are a specialist piece of equipment that make it safe to actually look at the sun because they filter out 99.999% of the sun's light. For comparison, like sunglasses, you know, filter anywhere from like 60 to 90% of the sun's light out. So they are great because it means you can actually fully look and watch the eclipse, but do be careful if you are going to try and buy some because in the run up to the last eclipse in 2017, there were a lot of counterfeit ones available online. The first check is to see if they pass the international safety standard, but you should always do a second check in your house as well before looking at the sun with them. So if you hold them up to a light in your house, the only thing that you should be able to see through the eclipse glasses is like the filament of the light bulb. If you can see anything else like lampshades or any other shapes around it, they're probably not filtering enough light and they're not safe enough to look at the eclipse. You should also do this if you've had some sort of eclipse glasses like buried in a drawer somewhere in your house since the last eclipse to go across the US in 2017. There could be scratches on them or anything. So make sure you always double check them. Like I'll pop a link in the video description below to the American Astronomical Society website where they link to suppliers of safe eclipse glasses and filters for cameras and telescopes. Scopes. Solar eclipse glasses will sell out fast though. So don't worry if you don't manage to get your hands on any. There are a few other ways that you can project an image of the eclipse down onto the ground so that you can safely view it. The first option is to make a pinhole camera, which is a really fun activity to do with kids. I'll link a NASA video with instructions on how to do that in the video description down below. Or my favorite way to view the eclipse is to just grab one of these, a vegetable strainer, a colander, whatever you call it, put your back to the sun and then hold this up over your shoulder. And the image of the eclipse will get projected through all of the little holes and down onto the ground. Pop a piece of white paper on the ground as well and it's even easier to see. I think I love this way the most just because you feel really Really stupid just like stuck there with a colander like over your shoulder but it really really works and it's so clear to see as well so you can do this like intermittently over like the two and a half hours that the eclipse lasts just like watching the moon move further across the sun every time you know you do it again or you can even set it up you know outside and set like a time lapse going recording like the piece of paper that it's projecting down onto and that would look really cool as well if you want to try and document the eclipse with your camera then that is great, but make sure that you get a solar filter for your lens in the same way that you get eclipse glasses that we were talking about before. And do not look down the viewfinder of your camera directly at the sun, you will damage your eyes. Look, I'll pop a link in the video description down below with tips on all the settings you should use on your camera to get the best results. But remember, enjoyment comes first, capturing it comes second. Don't spend the entirety of the eclipse just fiddling around with settings on your camera and miss the actual event itself. And finally, why care about an eclipse? You know, apart from the fact that people describe experiencing totality as this life-changing experience that everybody should witness at some point in their lifetimes, which I am, really, really hoping to because, you know, I'm an astronomer that still hasn't seen a total solar eclipse and I'm not jealous of everyone going to the eclipse in April at all. You know, apart from that, there is actually a lot of science that we can learn during a total solar eclipse. For example, we can study the corona of the sun, which is the outer atmosphere of the sun. It's a lot fainter than the rest of it. And it's really only revealed during an eclipse and sort of looks like flames around the moon. Like we still don't really understand the corona of the sun, especially how and why it's as hot as it is because the corona of the sun is a million degrees Celsius. Compare that with the surface of the sun, which is only 5,500 degrees Celsius. So that temperature difference is absolutely incredible. And we can't explain why it's the way that it is. So studying it during total solar eclipses really helps with our models of what's going on in the corona. We can also work out the diameter of the sun during an eclipse from how big it appears compared to the moon. Plus an eclipse provided one of the first tests for Einstein's theory of general relativity. His brand new theory of gravity, which he published in 1915 with a lot of maths to back it up, but not as many observations to back it up in terms of evidence. Now general relativity describes gravity as massive objects curving space itself and any other objects around them will travel on that curved space. 
So you can think of the planets orbiting the sun as like ping pong balls on a trampoline with a basketball in the middle curving the trampoline. What it means though is that light traveling on that curved space will then get its path bent by the heavy object. So Einstein predicted that during an eclipse, the stars that became visible behind the sun would be in slightly different positions than normal because the light path got bent by the sun's gravity. Thankfully, there was an eclipse a few years later in 1919, about four years after he published his theory of general relativity that allowed this to be tested, that showed that Einstein's prediction was right and ended up being another piece of evidence in favor of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So yes, eclipses are great fun to watch when done safely. You know, it always feels like I have this like strong connection to like things beyond earth when I'm watching an eclipse, right? And it's like, you can see the movements of solar system bodies like in real time with your own eyes and that never ceases to absolutely blow my mind. And even more so when you factor in this incredibly rich and long history that eclipses have in helping us figure out some of the mysteries of our universe. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Brilliant is one of my favorite websites and apps. It's where you can learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in science, maths, data analysis, programming, and AI. It's this interactive learning that makes Brilliant so effective because Brilliant helps you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also become a better thinker at the same time. A skill that is key for any scientist, but it also helps you better navigate the modern world. So with all of these generative AI tools out there now, you might want to learn how language learning models work. With Brilliant, you can explore how these LLMs build vocabulary and choose their next word, along with understanding the importance of what data you train these algorithms on by comparing models trained on Taylor Swift lyrics to models trained on a cookbook or big text terms and conditions. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky. I'll pop that link in the video description down below. And with it, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. New microphone, new microphone. How is it sounding? I'm testing the microphone. Oh, oh no, my friendship bracelet just fell off. Hang on a minute. Gotta put it back on. Ah, can't see because of my own hair. Yeah, but Taylor Swift doesn't have this problem. Do be careful because there are some counterfeit eclipse gases, gases, eclipse gases. There's some counterfeit eclipse gases. Or, oh, oh, it's wet. <laughs> My favorite way to view the eclipse though is to just hold up one of these, vegetable strainer or colander, whatever you want to call it. And what you should do essentially is turn around and put your back, turn around. Every now and then I get a little bit lonely and you're never coming around.